chose to, to focus on some uh, specific artworks, features, um, gestures that share the will of uh, conjuring up, standing against, and debunking colonial reflexes, and a uh, white male gaze. And I will mostly evoke the, the work of black women artists, uh, not as a narrow category that would exist in itself, um, and that could not be considered within a larger frame, but um, as an obvious way to, to recall a community of experiences uh, and a way to acknowledge the shared situation of beings having to endure uh, specific colonial predation and violence uh, and patriarchy, uh, and to build their own emancipation. And we must add that, uh, as Adrienne Rich puts it, patriarchy can be simply considered as the model for other forms of domination, uh, this including slavery, colonization, and uh, of course the uh, current exploitation of uh, uh, capitalist exploitation of people and resources. Well, today I want to share these gestures that set performance as one of the most um, vivid space for the creation of decolonial aesthetics inside Western art history through uh, recalling and reclaiming other spaces and other uh, temporalities of art and, and for art. So um, I eventually decided uh, while preparing this presentation to start by the end of the alphabet. So let's start with uh, Z for Zora, Zora Neale Hurston. You may be surprised that I include uh, Hurston in a lecture dedicated to performance, but I think what she, she created with uh, the stagings became a seminal methodology and inspiration for, for many performers uh, after her. And uh, Hurston is best known for her literary work uh, as novelist, short story writer, playwright, anthropologist, and folklorist. But she has been largely absent from uh, the dense history literature, uh, or from the history uh, and, and, and performance uh, literature, uh, the art history, sorry, and performance literature. Um, and it, it's becoming better now, but... Uh, and, and her choreographic stagings, stagings of uh, Africanist folk material in the 30s and her extensive studies of Haitian uh, and Jamaican voodoo are something that uh, was truly intended to debunk a white but also a male gaze on African-American culture. Uh, why do I say that? Because in the 20s and 30s, with the Harlem Renaissance and the New Negro Movement, it is easy to consider the period as one of renewal, confidence, and black pride, which is partly true. But most of the artists were um, feeling an inherent contradiction and, and a major difficulty when it came to determine um, what was their literary and visual culture while being surrounded by a white hegemonic culture, of course, and, and because Claiming for Africa or for some Africanity, and it, it's still an issue today, uh, in this context seemed legitimate, but it was also running the risk of being easily trapped into a primitivism. Uh, white people expected them to embody and represent. And I think this was especially true for visual artists, and this was especially an issue for black African-American men, because there may be uh, more to interact with patrons, like uh, Charlotte Osgood Mason or Calvin Veston, who press them to create or recreate and revive their culture through primitivism, and uh, of course, an idealized uh, primitivism. And in this context, Hurston acted in a way that uh, often seemed insolent even to uh, uh, fellow black men, um, because by studying and fixing the traces of an African-American tradition that was not fantasized at all, and that was totally not elitist, she gave value to a culture that seemed even degrading to most of her colleagues. And we have to understand that the strategy of most of the African-American uh, intellectuals of this time was to create their own black elitist uh, references. But Hurston was one of the first to dare confront uh, racist stereotypes through low black culture itself. And that's what she does through um, her dance staging that I see as major performances. So here she is.
doing the products, we should do it like that to imagine the movement. It's like that. Um, and um, um, Michelle Wallace, she, she's a writer. Uh, in the essay she wrote about her stone called Invisibility Blues, uh, she says that at a time when the Ku Klux Klan was still lynching blacks en masse and the tone of racial wisdom a la William Dubois and Richard Wright was dignified and dramatic, Hurston rejected the racial uplift agenda of the talented tents on the premise that ordinary blues had something to say too. And more concretely, this means, for instance, that she tries to understand, to understand through folk songs and dances why and how the idea that black people were monkeys' parents was generally accepted within the black community itself of this time, which was a kind of taboo within the black community itself. And she dared to ask herself in um, 1942, in her autobiography, among blacks, there was a general acceptance of the monkey as kinfolk. Perhaps it was some distant memory of tribal monkey reverence from Africa. Perhaps it was an acknowledgement of our talent for mimicry with the monkey as a symbol. And that's why when she studied folk culture, she tried as best as she could to immerse herself within the culture without judging it, just trying to understand how it was built and by who. Um, and when she reenacted dances, she shared data and observation, and when she learned the dances, she didn't just observe, she participated with the people, uh, learning the, the, the intricacies and, and feelings behind the dances. Um, well, to, to conclude on Erston, I would like to make you uh, hear her. It's in uh, 1935, she traveled to Florida to collect folklore for the Library of Congress, and she heard the Crow Dance in Jacksonville, and here it's, uh, she, she comments and sings it. That is evidently come from Africa. Dr. Herskovitz says that he saw the background of it in West Africa, of the crow. The crow in some way seems to be sacred in Africa. But what they're talking about is what we know in, in the United States is a buzzard. And the, and the buzzard comes to get something to eat. And they are talking about it. And they dance it. And one person gets in the center and uh, imitates the buzzard. And they say, and the rest of them uh, form the background. <clears throat> oh, my mama, come see that crow. See how he flies. Oh, mama, come see that crow. See how he flies. This crow, this crow, gonna fly tonight. See how he flies. This crow, this crow, gonna fly tonight. See how we fly. Oh, my mama, come see that crow. See how he fly. Oh, my mama, come see that crow. See how he fly. Okay, um, I would love to, to continue with uh, another brilliant and uh, funny series of performances by uh, artist Lauren O'Grady. Um, O'Grady's first public performance was called Mademoiselle Bourgeoise Noire. And um, it, it, it's, it remains a, a, a pivotal work on race, gender, and class critique. Um, so O'Grady was dressed in a costume made of uh, 180 pairs of white gloves. And she was carrying a cat on tail's whip made from syrup studded with white chrysanthemums. And she made uninvited appearances at openings um, in, in, in New York, in the, for instance, at the New Museum and in Gary's, uh, demanding attention for black women artists. So she marched into crowds wearing a tiara, often shooting uh, manifesto-like poems or beating herself with the cat and nine tails. And these guerrilla invasions, uh, as she calls them herself, took place in a variety of sites. Mm. So yes, I told you in the, in the New York art world. Um, and, and her invented backstory was that of a beautiful pageant winner from French Guiana, Mademoiselle Bourgeoise Noir. Um, and and she, she really offered a, a potent critique of, of, of infrastructure, of which she was part. And she, she clearly targeted the racial divide in the early 80s art world, and also the, the racial uh, apartheid 
uh, still prevailing in the mainstream art world, and she also targeted the second wave feminist movements lack of attention to issues of, uh, of, of race and class. So here are a few pictures. So it's, it's during openings. And um, uh, O'Grady considered that the, the performances were a failure uh, because the art world would not become meaningfully integrated until maybe the Adrian Piper and, and David Emmons exhibits uh, of the, yes, in, in 1988-89. But uh, Mademoiselle Bourgeoise Noire is, um, I think, a great work, and, and it had a, a mythic aftermath. Uh, for instance, in the mid-80s, uh, the costume was purchased by Basil Norton. So here you have a picture of the collection. And finally, in 2007, it was positioned as an entry point to WAC Art and the Feminist Revolution, which was one of the first uh, museum exhibition on the originating period of, of feminist art. And O'Grady was really uh, happy of, of that. Um, so let's continue with uh, Joyce Scott and uh, Kilawa. Um, so in, in 1986, artist Joy Scott, in collaboration with uh, actress and comedian uh, Kay Lawal, formed the two-person performance troupe, The Sunder Thick Review, subtitled For Fat Women Only and the Men Who Have the Guts to Come, or Our Egos Are Bigger Than Our Asses. And uh, they performed in several multimedia shows through the United States and Europe, using satire to examine obsessive behavior and society's views of over overweight African-American women. And uh, this is also an interesting case of something that did not start and spread only in the art world, uh, in the strict sense of the term, but that should be considered as a key moment in the history of performance from my point of view. And uh, in the States, the Sunday Thick Review appeared in art museums and in galleries, uh, as well as in many theaters, which is interesting. And Scott and Lowell also, for instance, staged a review um, at the Edinburgh Festival in Scotland, so it was. And um, yeah, well, they engage issues surrounding uh, the representation and perception of the, the body, and more specifically, the black female body in American society. And the first performance they produced was called Woman of Substance. And it was a performance in which the tradition of exhibiting the non-white body in uh, public spectacles was central. Um, so in Women as of Substance, uh, Scott appears in the guise of Sarji Bartman. So Sarji Bartman is the actual name of the Khoisan South African woman that has been called and remembered as the Hottentot Venus. So I think you know her. Um, she is an actual woman. And the lights, um, so, so during, the, during Women of Substance, the lights in the performance space dim, sobering the atmosphere of the room, and Scott walks slowly to the center of the stage, wearing an extension of her buttocks made out of sponge. And only her sheer stocking covers the rest of her body, um, and she's illuminated by a bright white spotlight. There's no video of it, that's why I... <laughs> um, and um, uh, she stares blindly out at the audience and she begins a mournful cry and she laments being far away from home in South Africa and discusses her infinite loneliness since she was brought to new shores. And um, in her portrayal of, of Bartman, Scott tells of the violation and humiliation of her body as an object of public display. And she also speaks of her influence in the popular culture of Europe, which is really interesting in the 19th century, uh, uh, because such as how uh, popular women's fashion device like the Brussel, which was a, a padded butt extension that was inspired by her. And, and Scott speaks as Sarji Bartman, but during the monologue, one can also understand that part of it are, are really her own words. Um, and uh, Bartman is part of the cast of characters that Scott and Lowell employ to express, and I, I quote them, the pain and passion of being the other, an overweight black woman in this society. And in the scene that precedes the Authentic Venus performance, uh, Scott appears as uh, Venus from Botticelli's uh, famous painting. So she is outfitted in sponge replicas of Venus shells and uh, flowing dirty blonde hair. And, and, and she described this Venus as a quintessential personification of beauty in Western art. And by performing the two vignettes together, um, by introducing the audience to these two Venuses, 
Um, Scott also highlights the, the vast discrepancy, of course, between the Western beauty ideal epitomized in the, the Botticelli's Venus and the condemnation of the black female body in Western culture. Um, because, of course, while the latter becomes the, the, the celebrated subject of Western painting, the former's body is fetishized in public freak shows. And uh, during Women of Substance, there are other characters. There are uh, a black statue of liberty, uh, and there is also a dialogue with a refrigerator, which is quite great. And uh, all the women of substance in the performance encourage their audience to examine the stereotypes uh, people all base on, on physical appearance in, in general. And um, Scott said her aim in performance art is to seize gross stereotypes and fuck with them. Um, and I show you an extract of another performance. Creepy talk about me, say baby. You're so complete, I wanna die. I wanna die to feet because the power to the power, <laughs> the power of the beauty. It's the dark beauty. Let me put this in right there. Offer you a new director. Oh, oh, oh. I'd say a word of a performance piece by uh, Senga Nengudi. Uh, so the title of the piece is uh, Répondez s'il vous plaît, please respond. And um, please respond uh, was the request in, in, uh, in Nengudi's uh, 1977 exhibition, uh, uh, exhibition at, at Just Above Midtown Gallery in New York. And uh, Nengudi started to work with uh, Penty Holes uh, because she had the idea of a show that would fit into her purse. And uh, she spent years altering such inexpensive everyday materials, carrying notion of constriction and beauty uh, to question, uh, yeah, accepted understandings of the body. Um, so I think. In, in, in her work, uh, both corporeal and societal limitations of the female body are explored through pantyhose. Um, uh, the pantyhose is stretched, filled, knotted, and pulled. And uh, the stocking in the series, uh, Please Respond, um, is, is really like, um, it, it assumes biomorphic qualities, um, both grotesque and beautiful. And I think with, with pantyhose, uh, speaks to the, to the endurance of the human body, and in particular, the female body, the female body, and, and it, it speaks of its physical transformation. Um, and the panty house filled with sand, droop, and sag, uh, it, it, it takes forms resembling a mother womb or weighty breast, and when it's stretched and twisted, it, it evokes pain and violence, especially when the, the legs are pulled apart. And uh, in 1977, she, she did a performance piece with uh, Marina Singer um, uh, in Los Angeles. And uh, the stocking acted really as a metaphor for the restriction placed on women by society. Um, and the web of ponchos was affixed to the walls and tangled, and, and it untangled and restrained Nenguji and, and a singer as they tried to move the space. Um, so it's. It looks like that, for instance. And um, I think it's, it's, it's really beautiful work, and, and, and Nengudi's work it, it is also, um, she, she has a long interest in, in experimenting with material to test their physical properties. Uh, she also works with bicycle tires, uh, vinyl tubes, and rope, as well as water, air, and sand. And, um, it's both elements that exist through the natural, uh, natural world and, and through the manufactured world. And, and these objects, I think, resonate with every viewer. And in addition, by, by using um, previously worn ponchos, she imbues her sculpture and performance pieces with, with a bodily presence. And it is uh, impossible to forget that such stockings are meant to be worn by women uh, whose bodies can be seen as haunting the work themselves. 
Um, and yeah, it's, it's really a strong work when you, when you see it. And I think, yeah, it's these presences that she, she addresses and um, she explores how, how far the female body itself can, can go. Well, um, something very different. Um, so thanks to the work of art historians like uh, Miriam Kershaw or the, the great Olivier Lussac in France, um, Grace Jones' work is known, seen, and studied today, of course, as being this of a singer and a model, but of a mighty performer in all the sense of this term, uh, and it's, it's great. Uh, so in the late uh, uh, 70s and 80s, Grace Jones boldly interrogated both racial and sexual stereotypes uh, associated with the black female body through her work in performance. Um, Jones is a Jamaican-born artist, as you know, and she was actively working in the Parisian fashion world as a model. At the time, she moved into performance uh, art. And uh, her involvement and popularity in the Parisian fashion world as a spectacle, being a model, may be compared uh, with the like of Josephine Baker or Sarge Bartman before her, um, but not in the, in the same condition. Um, so black females whose bodies became the, the locus of the Parisian imagination. Um, John's bold and often confrontational dress and performance style played with and disrupted primitivist myths about black sexuality. And she, she worked in collaboration with artists like Jean-Paul Goode and Kisa Ring, and she transformed her body into medley characters, uh, many of which satirized a primitivist reading of the black female body. And the multiple personas of Grace Jones range widely from overly sexualized dance performances in which she uh, done a gorilla or tiger to very masculinized self-representation. And for these performances, Jones would appear with a, a, a crew cut like that in a, in a tailored man's suit. Um, and Miriam Kershaw, who, who wrote this book, Postcolonialism and Androgyny, the performance of the performance art of Grace Jones, which is a, a great uh, essay, uh, relates these modes of representation in Jones' work as an hypersexualized animal uh, and as instances of cross-dressing to Josephine Baker's performances, and most specifically uh, her jungle performances in Banana and Tusk Skirt. And of course, uh, Josephine Baker is also a great performer. Um, and, and, and she also relates, for instance, this uh, with the famous photographs of uh, Baker in top hat and, and tuxedo. And um, in, in 1985, Jones collaborated with Kissaring in a performance stage at Paradise Garage, an alternative uh, dance club in New York. And for uh, this performance, Haring painted Jones' body in a um, characteristically uh, Haring stylized white design. But interestingly, um, these this drawings by Haring were inspired by the body paintings of the African Maasai, and, and Jones uh, knew that, of course. Uh, and she, she also had on her body with an elaborate uh, sculptural, sculptural assemblage of uh, pieces of rubber, plastic, shin, and metal. That's this. Um, creating by uh, Kisaring and David Spada. Um, and she, she had um, a, a sculptural headdress that topped off the costume, and her breasts were delineated with, so you maybe, well, yeah, um, protruding uh, metal coils, and these metal coils were a deliberate reference to an iron wire sculpture um, of Josephine Baker made by artist uh, Alexander Calder. So the, the watching was really in reference with other. Uh, and later in the performance, Jones appeared in a Baker-style skirt composed of yellow neon spikes. Uh, so through the painting, adornment, and uh, importantly uh, through her performance, of course, uh, Jones played with this iconic sign of the primitive and uh, transformed these signifiers and her body into maybe a site of power. But it's um, so. Uh, this is uh, another great performance uh, by uh, Coco Fusco and uh, Guillermo Gomez Peña. Uh, maybe you, you know this performance, it's, it's very famous. Uh, they enclosed their, their own bodies in a 10 by 12 foot cage and presented themselves as two 
previously unknown specimens representative of the Guatinoe people. And inside, inside the cage, uh, Fusco and Peña outfitted themselves in uh, outrageous costume and preoccupied themselves with performing equally outlandish native tasks. Uh, Peña was dressed in an Aztec style uh, uh, breastplate uh, with a leopard skin face wrestlers and a, a Fusco uh, with a grass skirt, a leopard skin bra, baseball cap and sneakers. And she also braided her hair as a readily identifiable sign of native authenticity. So, um, in, in a similar fashion to the live human spectacles of the past, Fusco and Peña performed the role of cultural author for their museum audiences. Uh, while on display, the artist's tradition, traditional daily rituals range from sieving voodoo dolls, to uh, lifting weights, to watching television, to working on laptop computers. And uh, during feeding time, museum guards passed bananas to the artists, and when the couple needed to use the bathroom, they were escorted from their cage on a leash. And for a small donation, Fusco could be pursued to dance, to rap music, or both performers would pose for Polaroids. That's uh, what you see there. And the signs assured the visitors that the Guatinois were jovial and playful race with a genuine affection for the debris of Western industrialized popular culture. Uh, both of the Guatineries are quite affectionate in the cage, seemingly uninhibited by their physical and sexual habits, despite the presence of an audience. And two museum guards from local institutions uh, stood by the cage and supplied the inquisitive visitor with additional equally fictitious information about the couple. Um, what is interesting is that despite Fusco and Peña's professed intention that uh, the work should be perceived as a satirical commentary, more than half of the visitors to the museum who came upon the performance believe that the fictitious Guatinari identities were real. Uh, and they performed this piece in many, many countries uh, and uh, yeah, in, in the world and during two years. So it's, it's quite uh, yeah, interesting or frightening. Um, and in a quote about uh, Undiscovered Amerigen, which is the, the title of the work, uh, Coco Fusco explains that she and Peña aim to conduct a reverse ethnography. She said, our cage became a blank screen onto which audiences projected their fantasies of who and what we are. As we assume the stereotypical role of the domesticated savage, many audience members felt entitled to assume the role of colonizer, only to find themselves uncomfortable with the implications of the game. Okay, um, so um, I, I announced in the description of this lecture that I will start with A, like Adrian for Adrian Piper. Uh, because she's the first artist from uh, all these artists I, I, I spoke about that I met and uh, loved as a, a young art historian and who made me discover all the others. Uh, but as I reverse the, the whole thing, let's end with this uh, major, major artist. Uh, most of you uh, know this, this work, maybe, the Calling Card uh, series. Um, and I, I could have chosen to, to speak of so many artworks because she is, she is really a pro prolific artist. But I would like to say a word about uh, another work that is Funk Lessons. So um, Adrian Piper staged a number of collaborative performance events entitled Funk Lessons uh, from uh, 1982 to 84, in which participants were invited to get done and party together. And um, in the process of learning to discuss, dance, and listen to funk music, the events opened up individual awareness of the complex personal association of this popular dance form with racial and cultural boundaries. Um, and the, the, the experience held the possibility of overcoming inhibition, or it was uh, Piper's ID. And what, was in, what is interesting is that at this time she was doing a fellowship at Stanford University. So um, she did this in a, yeah, in a, in a youth university context. And uh, she, she explained in a notes on Funk uh, One, it, it's a text she wrote in uh, 1985, 
that the lessons format during this process became even more clearly a kind of didactic foil for collaboration. Dialogue quickly replaced pseudo-academic lecture or demonstration, and social union replaced the audience performer separation. What I purported to teach my audience was revealed to be a kind of fundamental sensory knowledge that everyone has and can use. So I propose to end with one of our lessons. I could have speak of many, many other artists uh, like Rene Green, Lydaston Harris, and Rene Valerie Cox, or Lorna Simpson, uh, and many, many contemporary artists, of course. But um, that's it for today, and thank you. Thank you.